Welcome students to lesson four of the natural hazards topic. In this lesson, I introduce our two case studies of earthquake events. We're going to look at Chile in South America and Pakistan in South Asia. And you're going to see in future lessons how the effects of these earthquakes were so different and why. In this lesson, I just introduce these two countries and how people live in them. Please write the date, title and learning objective and have a pen and paper ready to learn. Time to review prior learning. Please write one to six, answer the questions from memory and then mark your answers. Game time. Destructive, number one. Two, destructive as well. Three, conservative. Four, convection currents, five, friction, six, hazard risk. Give yourselves a mark out of six. If you got five or more, excellent. If you got the first four correct, fantastic. If not, go back to the previous lessons, watch them again, and then come back to these questions in a week's time and test yourself on them until you've memorized them. To introduce these case studies, I'm going to show you two photos from other earthquakes in NHIC and in LIC and I'm going to ask you to answer the questions about these photos so that you start to think about how earthquakes have different impacts. This is Japan in 2011 after a large earthquake there and this is Pakistan in 2005 after a similar earthquake there. So number one, describe the impact. Well. In Japan, there's no discernible or no noticeable impact on the place. This photo was taken just a few days after the earthquake. Well, admittedly, it's quite far inland, so it wasn't affected by the tsunami. But the shaking from the earthquake did very little damage. The building has been designed to resist the shaking. All the infrastructure, similarly, has been designed to resist shaking. The occupants, the people who lived there, survived the earthquake. By contrast, in Pakistan, in the city of Islamabad here. A major apartment block collapsed, killing more than 300 people who were buried inside. Families coming home from work, parents coming home to find their children buried alive. It was a terrible disaster. So number two, why did the earthquakes affect them so differently? Well, the infrastructure is so different. Japan, AHIC, has the money and the people have the money to be able to invest in infrastructure that resists earthquakes. Pakistan, by contrast, does not have that same infrastructure. There is also the idea of corruption here. Corruption is where governments and people in power use money and power for their own benefit and not to help the people. In Pakistan, corruption is a major problem because money that the government should use to help build stronger buildings is in fact kept by people in power. In Japan that doesn't happen nearly as often, so the money is spent protecting people from earthquakes. 3. What could be done in the future to reduce the impact on Pakistan? Well, you could have said to build stronger buildings. You may have said to improve hospitals and emergency services so that it's quicker to get people out from damaging situations. You may have said that Pakistan might try to reduce corruption, so there's more money available for homes like these. These are all important ideas. Now, it's time to introduce our countries, Chile and Nepal. The first key word is describe this situation here. The earthquake has directly caused this problem. The building is collapsed because of the shaking. We call that a primary effect. Primary is the key part of this. An effect is anything that happens because of a natural hazard. And the primary effect directly happens because of the hazard itself. So because of the shaking, in this case. And primary effects cause other effects that last a longer time or that affect people into the future. For example, this primary effect, the building collapsing, causes this primary effect, homelessness. Secondary effect is an effect that results from the primary effect. 
and so earthquakes and all natural hazards have both primary and secondary effects, where the primary effect happens immediately and the secondary effect happens as a result. Let's see if you understand these ideas. Write primary or secondary next to 1 to 6 for each of these statements. So number 1, I should have said primary. 2, secondary. The loss of income happens because the building was destroyed, not because of the shaking. So there's a secondary effect. 3, secondary. The shaking didn't make them homeless. The building collapsing made them homeless. 4, primary. The flood directly destroyed the farmland. The flood is the hazard. 5. Secondary. Loss of income is secondary. Flights being cancelled is primary. 6. Secondary. Give yourselves a mark out of 6. If you've got 5 or more, you really understand this. Okay. Chile versus Nepal. Chile is our HIC and Nepal is our LIC. I'm going to introduce these two countries so you see how life is different in each of them. Let's start with Chile. Chile is a country located on the west coast of South America. It is a HIC, one of the richest countries in the world. It is a democracy, which means the people choose their leaders in elections. And it regularly experiences earthquakes because it's on a plate boundary. The major city in Chile is called Santiago. That's the capital city. All in all, it has more than 7 million people within it and it's located on a flat valley between mountains. It has lots of modern buildings and wealthy people. The GDP per capita in Santiago is more than $30,000 per year, making it, Chile, one of the richest countries in the world by income. It has large, strong buildings, skyscrapers such as these, made of modern materials designed to resist earthquakes. Within these buildings are big companies that make large incomes, energy companies, retail companies, and other companies that provide people with high paid jobs. Construction workers earn a good income in Chile compared to in less rich parts of the world. They are also well trained to ensure that buildings are properly constructed. And there are strict building laws in Chile that mean that no building can be constructed in a way that doesn't resist earthquakes. When children grow up in Chile, they're very likely to get a good education. Almost everyone in Chile can read and write, and many go to university, so they become highly skilled and can get high-paid jobs. More than 99% of people in Chile are literate, can read and write. And finally, healthcare in Chile is generally excellent. Chile has a life expectancy that puts it in the top quarter of all countries in the world. And if you go to a hospital in Chile, you're likely to get excellent medical care using modern medicines and well-trained doctors. The hospitals themselves are modern and unlikely to collapse during an earthquake. By contrast, Nepal. Located north of India and south of China, Nepal is a thin landlocked country in the south of Asia. Landlocked means it doesn't have a border with the sea. It is a poor country, mostly made up of mountainous land. It is part of the Himalayan mountains, the highest mountains in the world that stretch across here, of which the most famous is Mount Everest, located here within Nepal. Vast, sprawling, which means widely spread out cities in Nepal, most famously the capital city Kathmandu, K-A-T-H-M-A-N-D-U, is made up of mostly three or four story apartment blocks like these made of bricks. There are very few environmental regulations and building regulations in Nepal, which means that builders often construct homes and offices that are not designed to resist strong earthquakes because it is cheaper to do this. Any building laws that exist in Nepal are not always enforced, which means that if a builder breaks the law, he isn't necessarily fined. One of the main sources of income for Nepal is tourism. People hiking up Mount Everest, for example, here. 
It often costs up to $50,000 to hike up Mount Everest. This provides a great source of income for the country. Unfortunately, much of the revenues, the income from tourism, does not go to the local people, but rather to the government. And that means that people have low incomes. The GDP per capita in Nepal in 2015 was just $1,700. By contrast, in Chile in 2010, where their earthquake happened, it was $17,000. The jobs in Nepal are not universally available to everyone. Not everyone has a job. Often there is 20% unemployment, so a fifth of people lack a job, which means they lack an income. Construction jobs such as these reflect how poor quality many of the buildings are, made of bricks which break easily during earthquakes. The jobs are also low paid very often. Only a very small minority of people have access to high paid, reliable jobs. Education similarly is problematic. If you live in England, you may know of Nepalese students who study here. That's partly because people in Nepal seek to educate their children better than through the school system available in Nepal. Class sizes are very large and teachers are often not well trained. Only a tiny percent of people in Nepal actually go on to study at university. Meaning that these children, when they grow up, lack the skills to apply for high paid jobs or to start their own businesses. And consequently, they're less able to afford to build stronger homes or to educate themselves about the risks of earthquakes and how to prevent them. Similarly, healthcare is inadequate, which means not good enough. Hospitals such as these in Kathmandu are often overcrowded and unable to deal with the number of people that come in after a natural hazard such as an earthquake. They often only treat the people who have high incomes or who live in cities. It's very difficult to reach a hospital when you live in a rural area, the countryside, in Nepal. Meaning that if you're injured or ill, good quality healthcare is difficult to get. And finally, because of its mountainous terrain, transport around Nepal is difficult. To get from villages to cities, you have to travel often through narrow mountain passes such as these on crowded buses, which takes a very long time. After an earthquake, these mountain passes can become blocked by landslides as the rock collapses and blocks the road, meaning that reaching people who are injured in villages is impossible. This whole situation means that Nepal is more vulnerable, which means people are more likely to be hurt by earthquakes than Chile is. The earthquakes themselves. Chile's happened on the 27th of February 2010, by contrast Nepal's on the 25th of April 2015. So you'd think that Nepal has an advantage because after five years it had developed more over time. Countries get richer over time. So what actually happened in the earthquakes? Well Chile's struck off the west coast about halfway up on the 27th of February 2010 during the night. It was 8.8 .8 on the Richter scale, making it one of the strongest earthquakes of all time. And it occurred some 30 kilometers beneath the ground. That was the focus. Due to the deeper focus, the Chilean earthquake was not felt as strongly as it might have been. It happened because the Nazca plate, oceanic, subducted beneath the South American plate, continental. The sudden movement created an enormous earthquake. However, because the actual focus was slightly deeper than on a conservative or collision boundary where two continental plates collide, much of the energy was lost before it reached towns. By contrast, in Nepal, there is a collision plate boundary that looks like this. Two continental plates are crashing into each other, which forms the Himalayan mountains. The friction between these plates means that this doesn't happen in a regular process. It happens suddenly in jolting movements. And these movements create very powerful earthquakes. And the focus is often quite near the surface. The Nepal earthquake, while only 7.9 on the Richter scale, so 100 times weaker than the strongest earthquake of all time and 10 times weaker than the Chilean earthquake, 
occurred much closer to the surface, only 15 kilometers below the surface, meaning that the shaking was almost equally strongly felt. Time to assess learning. Question one. Describe the location of Chile in the world. Chile is located on the southwest coast of South America. It's a long, thin country that is west of Argentina, south of Bolivia. Question two. Describe the location of Nepal in the world. Nepal is a much smaller country. It's long and thin in shape. It's north of India and south of China. It's located generally regarding speaking in the Himalayan mountains. Question three. Explain how differences between Chile and Nepal's education system may affect their vulnerability to earthquakes. Because Chile has better education mostly than Nepal, people end up becoming more skilled when they're adults and having access to higher paid jobs. With these higher paid jobs, they have more money to afford to construct better homes and they pay more taxes to the government, which means the government has more money to invest in higher quality, stronger infrastructure, better medical care, and more organized and better equipped emergency services. And finally, explain why, although Chile's earthquake was more powerful on the Richter scale, the shaking was not much more severe than in Nepal. The focus of the Chilean earthquake was 30 kilometers underground, whereas the Nepal earthquake was only 15 kilometers underground. That's important because seismic waves, which spread out from earthquakes, weaken as they are absorbed by the ground that they travel through. Therefore, the further they have to travel to the surface, the weaker they get. Time to embed learning. Answer these questions using your understanding. Mark your answers in green pen and then review in a week's time by attempting these questions again from memory. Number one. You need two of these points. Number two, the location of Chile. Make sure you have the general description of the location for the first point and an example for the second point. Number three, any two of these points. Explain them as I have say why the example leads to different amounts of vulnerability. And four, any two of these points. Give yourselves a mark out of the total. If you dropped just two marks or fewer, fantastic, you've really understood this. If you drop more, come back to these questions in a week's time and attempt them again from memory to strengthen your memory of them. From this lesson, answer the difference between a primary and a secondary effect of hazards. If you got that question right, then fantastic, you really understood the key ideas of this lesson. Next lesson, we're going to be exploring the effects of the Chile and Nepal earthquakes. And in the final lesson on our case studies, we'll be looking at how these countries responded to help save lives. Join me then.